then Paul comes to Romans chapter 7 where he asks this question. And he goes on to say, Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to men who know the law, that the law has authority over a man as long as he lives? For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. So then if she marries another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and not as an adulteress, even though she marries another man. So, my brothers, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who is raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit to God. So in Romans chapter 7, now we see Paul is now addressing the wrong way of being sanctified. He has given us the prescription of the right way of being sanctified. A believer is to know who they are in Christ and to act accordingly. But here he says the wrong way has to do with us trying to keep the law of Moses or any other moral code by your own efforts or strength. Paul is saying sanctification is a work of the Spirit of God because you have been justified by faith through the work of Christ. Don't think that you're going to be sanctified by your own human efforts. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Galatians. He's speaking to uh, the, the believers in the region of Galatia, and Paul is really moved. He's really emotional as he speaks to them because they are trying to be sanctified, purified, and trying to be holy by observing religious, moral standards. And this is what Paul has to say to the church and the Christians in Galatia as they are seeking to be sanctified by their human efforts. Listen to what Paul says. He says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, who has tricked you and deceived you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law? Did you become justified? Were you regenerated? Did you become born again by obeying the law? Was it by your obedience to some moral standard or by believing what you heard? Were you justified by your works or were you justified by faith? Verse 3, he says, Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, being justified by Christ and by the Spirit having faith in Jesus Christ, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Are you trying to be sanctified in a different way than you were justified? No, you weren't justified by works. You were justified by faith. And the Spirit of God is the one who applied that faith that you might be declared righteous and justified. And he says, so why are you trying to switch up the, the mode and trying to switch up the method? No, the same way that you were justified is the same way that you will be sanctified by the Spirit of God. And so when we come to Romans chapter 7, Paul asks the question, do you not know, brothers? And he's talking to the Jews among the Christians there, the Jewish believers. And he says to them, do you not know that the law is binding, that it's an obligation, that you have a responsibility to it only until death? He's asking this question because there are believers who might still be trying to be sanctified by obeying this, this law of Moses, this bunch of rules and regulations, by being religious. And so Paul says, don't you know that your relationship to that has changed, that it's different now? And so he gives the example of marriage. And as he talked about that, he, he gave the example of a woman who was married and she was obligated to um, her covenant and the way that she relates to her husband until her husband dies. 
When her husband dies, she is no longer obligated to relate to him the way that she was when he was alive. His death dissolves the obligation that she had to that relationship with him. And then Paul takes that illustration, that example, and makes it into an analogy and says, In the same way, brothers, you also died to the law. You died. So you, you're, the, you're the husband in that illustration. You died and, and, and now no longer are you bound to that relationship, right? So he's saying Christians who are Jews and used to obey the law of Moses, you are no longer obligated to the law of Moses because you are now identified with Christ who died. When Christ died, you died, okay? So the question that I have for you is, who died according to this illustration? You died to the law through the body of Christ. That sounds weird. It sounds weird. What does Paul mean when he says you died to the law through the body of Christ? That means that we are no longer obligated to the law of Moses. Those Jewish believers who had been obeying the law of Moses and keeping the law of Moses, trying to live up to that moral standard to be sanctified, Paul says, you're not obligated to that anymore. That is not what sanctifies you. But you are obligated to the Spirit, and it is through the Spirit that you will be sanctified. It is through the Spirit that you will be made righteous, made holy, that you will become more and more like Jesus. And this, again, is what Paul argues in the book of Galatians. He says in chapter 5, Paul says this to these individuals who are still thinking they can be sanctified by their works. Paul says in Romans or Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. We are free from the law, free from the obligation to do these religious duties. He says, stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. He calls the law and the obligation to obey the law slavery. He says, don't make yourself a slave again to the to those moral codes, to those moral observations or those ceremonial observations that come through the law of Moses. Then he says in verse 13 of Galatians chapter 5, You, my brothers, were called to be free. You, as Christians, as Christ followers, Christ fulfilled the law. And now, if you are in Christ, you have fulfilled the law. So he says, do not use your freedom to indulge in the sin nature. Look, you're no longer bound to those things. You, you no longer have to observe the dietary laws. But that doesn't mean you go out and you become sinful in how you eat in the practice of eating. Don't do that. Don't use your freedom and the license that God has given you through Christ to no longer observe the dietary laws to go out and be a glutton or to, to eat in a manner that is not in harmony with God's design. He says the entire law is summed up in a single command. What is God trying to do? What is the goal of all of that law anyway? He says the, that it is to love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Hey, because you're not under the law anymore, you're under a greater law, the law to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says in verse 16, so I say, live by the Spirit. Look, it's by the Spirit that you live. It's by the Spirit that we become sanctified, by the Spirit that we become holy as Christ is holy. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your sinful nature. So, who died? Believers died to the law. We are no longer obligated to it. We are no longer responsible to obeying the law of Moses as Christians. And obeying the law of Moses is not how a person becomes uh, righteous in their living, their daily living. So, I have a question in light of that. I want to talk about this phrase, you died through the body of Christ. How did we die? How does a believer die? What does Paul mean here? And I want to suggest to you that this, this whole theme or theology is, is um, found or answered in this. The, the union with Adam that every person has 
turns into a union with the Messiah, Christ, for all who receive Christ. So what that means is, in Adam, every person is considered in Adam. And when you become a Christian and a Christ follower, your union switches from Adam. Now you are united to Christ. And this is really interesting because this is actually, Paul says this in so many other places in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15 or verse 17. He says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. You are no longer a part of Adam's fallen race, but you are now a part of the new man, which began with Christ Jesus. This is why Paul says in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, he says, for I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. That's that union with Christ. Christ, I was crucified with him and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So there's this union that we have with Christ in the same way that we had union with Adam. Paul actually uh, began to expound on this in Romans chapter 5. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, it says this, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way, death came to all men because all sin. So in Adam all died. There was this union that every human being has with Adam. When Adam sinned, every person that came forth from Adam was a sinner. And we, sin, we, are, we are born sinful. And this is why David can say in Psalm 51, he says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. He understood that he was united to Adam and was born alienated from God, born an enemy of God, an outcast, and someone who needed to be brought back into a right relationship with God. God. And Paul also goes on to develop and state this in Romans chapter um, 5, verse 18. He says, Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men. So when Adam sinned, we have this mysterious union with Adam because we get credit for Adam's sin as our federal head. And in the same way, we see that Christ becomes our federal head. It says this in uh, Romans chapter uh, 5 and verse 18. It says in part B, it says, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men, for any and all who would receive Christ. They have the, they, they receive the righteousness of Christ. The obedience of Christ is, is accounted and, and, and credited to them for what Jesus did. Not for what they did, but for what Jesus did. They are credited with that. And Jesus becomes a new Adam. He becomes the first of a new race of people, a people of perfection, a people of obedience, a people who love God and who live as accurate representatives bearing the image of God. And Paul actually mentions this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says in verse 45 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, in reference to Christ, was a life-giving spirit. Christ is called the last Adam. So he patter Christ is patterned after Adam, but he is the perfect image of the invisible God. Where Adam sinned and fell short, and his whole race, the whole human race, had fallen, and their image was scarred and marred and no longer a perfect representation of God. In Christ, if anyone is united to Christ, if anyone is in Christ, they become the image of God in the way that God intended through Adam. And when Adam failed, Christ prevailed. And in righteousness, there is this new humanity in 
Christ. And this concept is mentioned in other places. But first we have to understand, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, in verse 20, he's again talking about the law, right? He says, he says the law was added so that trespass might increase. See, if you're in Adam and you have the law of God, the law of God only makes you conscious of sin. It highlights the sinfulness of sin. It helps you to recognize that you are utterly sinful, guilty, and condemned as a part of Adam's fallen race. And what it should point you to is a need for a savior. And the last Adam, who is our new federal head, our new representation, he is our salvation. But that is not through law. That is through faith that we become a part of the new human race, the new man, the new humanity in Christ. This union with Christ is mentioned throughout Romans. Paul says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, when he's talking about whether or not we should keep sinning, whether we should go on sinning, he says you shouldn't. You shouldn't sin. You should stop you because you should know that you, are, um, you have been baptized into Messiah, into Christ Jesus. We were baptized into his death. So there is this union. When you become a Christian, there is this union with Christ that removes your union from Adam and places you in union with Christ. He goes on in Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. He says, if we have union with Christ, we are, sin will no longer be our master because we have died to the law and we are no longer under the law. Christ fulfilled the law perfectly. So the law can't condemn us. We are not under law, but we're under grace because we get credited with Jesus' perfect obedience to the law. So, so sin won't have mastery over us because sin is only effective when there's a law telling us that we, are, that we have fallen short. But Christ fulfilled the law. Therefore, we are not under the law. And sin can't entice us in the same way and condemn us positionally before God. And now, finally, we see in Romans chapter 7, Paul will continue on, and he says in Romans chapter 7, verse 6, as we talk about this concept of, of uh, how those who are believers, how we relate to sin, it also matters how we relate to the law. How we relate to sin and how we relate to the law are different now. Paul says this in verse 6 of Romans 7. But now, by dying to what once bound you, we have been released from the law. We are no longer under the law so that we serve in a new way, the way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. So what does that mean? How is a person to be sanctified practically? We are sanctified positionally. We are holy ones of God. We are uh, justified positionally. We are declared righteous, and God views us just as if we have never sinned. We are hidden and wrapped in the perfect righteousness and obedience of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Hallelujah. But how are we to be sanctified practically? It is not by continuing to, with human efforts to try and obey some outward standard. No, we are sanctified by living by the Spirit. And I want to suggest to you that the major way that we live by the Spirit is not by trying to be morally decent people. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we see a list of the practices and the disciplines of the, the first century church. And what they did was they exercised ordinary means of grace. They weren't religious. They were, they were exercising their faith in Christ and in the Spirit by exercising the ordinary means of grace. They were devoted to the apostles' teachings, to prayer, to fellowship, and the breaking of bread. So they were with believers 
focused on the gospel and they were uh, praying and asking God to sanctify them, to fill them, to change them, and to make them new, to help them by the power of his spirit to live a life that is pleasing to God and that reflects the image of Christ. And so this is the first four verses. Paul is talking about believers' relationship to sanctification and how the law is not a part of that sanctification process. 